Lionhearts, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. Well, today we are in Florida once again, back in the Tampa area. And if you remember the very beginning of this trip, we went out to Michael Braun's house who made all of the Macho Man Randy Savage clothes and designed them. Well, he got his start with rock and rollers before that. And today he's invited us back over to tell us those stories. So Days with Jordan the Lion and Michael Braun begins now. So today we'll talk about these beautiful clothes. And look at those sleeves. All right, Michael Braun, great to see you again. I've watched your documentary since the last time I was here. What a great documentary. It's on Amazon. It's called Made as Art, Michael Braun. And today you're going to show us some of the things that we lightly touched on last time. Now, we know that you started all this with a stolen sewing machine and you sewed up some clothes, amazingly sold them. Now, how did you get in the rock and roll business? Who was the first band that you dressed and how did you meet them? So, there's a local band, high school kids and first couple of years of college, playing in a local club. And we end up selling to them. I get them to come to the house. I talk to them. We get them to come to the house and I sell them five shirts, Nehru shirts, at $18 a piece. I then hold the cash, almost $90, in my hands. I show it to Tony, I say, look, we're rich. And Tony was look, your business partner to business let people partner, know. Tony Ackerman, exactly. Um, and the brains of the business part of it, for sure. Um, and shy. She could sell clothes, she can deal with anybody, but if you give her a choice, she's not doing that. She's mm -hmm. doing what she does uh, of running the thing. So I tell her one day that the Vanilla Fudge are coming to play at the Armory, which is whatever, a mile and a half away from where we were in South St. Pete. I go there. I follow the drummer, Carmine Apice, into the bathroom. Yeah, Carmine's awesome. And this is a very famous drummer to this day, played with Rod Stewart, but many, many people. And trained some of the most famous drummers now. He's amazing. Well, if amazing. you want to talk about connections with, so John Bonham, who played with a band you maybe never heard of called Led Zeppelin, <laughs> came in that early time. And Carmine taught him how to play really hard, loud, because at that time they weren't miking drums the way they were right, two years right. afterwards or were five years after. So he teaches them that. Anyway, he comes to, I get, I tell the four guys sort of individually, we make clothes, you want to come to the shop after the gig, whatever. Shop is a hundred dollar a month rental, South St. Petersburg, 1907 house, living room filled up, sewing machines, fabric everywhere, messy, you know, and Tony's living in one side, I'm living in another side. Anyway, so the fudge, three of the fudge of the four fudge come, they buy everything that remotely fits. No kidding. Everything. And we're standing in what was an old bedroom of mine and I have pants laid on the bed. They're standing there trying the pants on and everyone was size 28 to size 32 in those days. Wow, in life, yeah. In life and including them. Now the goal is 32 <laughs> for most people. <laughs> it's a different time, brother. That's all <laughs> I'm telling you. Now, I'm handing them the pants, one of them would try it on, then the next one would try it on, whatever it would fit, that, that's who was buying it, yeah. they would keep it. They are wearing what we call in America, no underwear. <laughs> no underwear, okay? And this is the time, this is what's Free ball. On, huh? They call it free ball. <laughs> free ball. Okay. So, 
it became fudge underwear was what we called ah! it after that. <laughs> anyway, so they bought everything that remotely could fit and again on the tops, shirts, and they ordered clothes. Now, unbeknownst to me, they're on the road and some guy, uh, some guitar player is playing with them on the gig. His name is Jimi Hendrix. He says to Carmine, and it's in the documentary, where'd you get the clothes? Yeah. Carmine says, our friends in Florida. If you said to me, I'll leave my friends, not to say I don't like them or I do like them, but I never thought of that word. Yeah. You know, our friends in Florida, which, you know, so now I know that Jimmy's coming to play at what's called Curtis Hickson Hall in Tampa, which is no longer there. But they got a big plaque and stuff that talks about Jimmy playing there. Anyway, I talked to the guy that's to bring Jimmy in, his name is Phil Gernhard, record producer, produced Stay by Maurice Williams and the Zodiacs, and numerous other songs um, at the time. I go to his office and I show him the clothes. This is a person with no visual sense whatsoever. And I'm not saying it as an insult. I'm just saying yeah. some people could be lawyers because they didn't know how to argue. You're yeah. asking me to be your lawyer? Forget it. You know, you're gonna... Well, some people are jeans and t-shirt. Like I think Carmine says in your, uh, in your documentary, he says, now the rock stars dress like roadies. But back then, you looked like a rock star when you were on stage. That's exactly right. He's making the point exactly right. So we go to see Phil Gernhardt. He says, listen, I don't want to, you know, bug Jimmy and stuff. He's an emotional guy, you know, I, I got a concert here, I don't, you know, I'm not so much concerned about clothes. He says, but I'll tell him, you'll call me, I'll tell him about you, you call me at 4 o'clock on Sunday. Sunday comes, 4 o'clock, he's playing at Curtis Hickson, I dial the number. He said, Michael, you're not going to believe this. Jimmy gets off the plane and says, where are the clothes people? No kidding. No you way. were the first thing on his mind. <laughs> so, now... We go to the hotel in downtown, the Sheridan Hotel in downtown Tampa, and I find out who, what room Noel's in, what room Mitch is in, what room's Jim. His band, in. yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to start at the bottom and work up. Understand that I'm green. Yeah. Way green. <laughs> and... And green at the time, we sold close to the fudge. You know, I'm just telling you, we're starting out. So I figured, well, I'll start with Noel or Mitch and then leave Jimmy, you know, so I tune into this thing. Unbeknownst to me, there was room switching. Ah. I knock on the door. I'm there with clothes that we made over my arms. Tony's there, clothes, no bags, just clothes. And another guy that's with us, clothes. Three people filled with clothes. That's six arms with clothes. Knock on the door. The door opens with the chain on it. Oh, no, we hear, the, hear this voice. And it's supposed to be Noel or Mitch. It's definitely not Noel, and it's definitely not Mitch. It's Jimmy. He says, who's there? I said, it's Michael and Tony with the clothes. He opens, he looks, he sees. He's seeing all the clothes. He opens the door, he unhooks it, opens the door, we walk in. There's a roll around round table that you bring in the food. Yeah. And it's there with his food on it. A chair, he's eating, but he's leaning back in the chair like this. He's like, like a 45 degree <laughs> angle. Yeah. And he even I'm, eats cool. <laughs> thank you. And I'm laying the clothes on the ground, the pants, on the floor of this bedroom, I mean of this living room. Now, I, again, I'm green. I start at the bottom. So I have the front seam pants that we make, but in street kind of materials. And he's looking, he's eating, he's looking, he's eating. I'm not getting over. We see this. And now we come to the stage clothes. 
And in those days, there's no such country as India, no such country as Japan. It doesn't exist. In the mindset of the youth right. in the United States. So I'm showing them the clothes, and now I have a pair of pants that are seen down the front and back that have embroidery all the way down. So if this is the side of the pants, it's yeah. narrow at the top, it's going like this, all the way down the pants. You want to open that up and grab me a pair of pants, Susan? Sure. Um, where did I get this? I'm going to the very proper ladies fabric stores in Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and in those days, people, ladies, would go to the fabric store, buy fabric, give me button pants, um, would buy fabric and take it to their seamstress, she'd make clothes for them. Right. Now Michael, with hair out to his shoulder, would walk in and be comfortable in the place to boot because they got what I need, meaning they got... Yeah, they've got that crazy material. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, buying these embroidered pieces of fabric, so it's 45 inch wide long fabric, they, they're going by a meter, which is 39 inches, and they got this triangle, so you're putting it on the front of the lady's dress or the back of her coat yeah. or whatever. But you started doing it with jeans. So now I'm making pants. So this is the side of the pants. Wow. The seams are down the front and back. So you see the shape. So they're tight at your knee. And, and no zipper. They, and then they go out to your, God forbid. <laughs> and they go out to the tip of your toe, to your shoes. So they got buttons on the wow. fly. And these are coat buttonholes. Very special sewing machine. Anyway, so now this embroidery is this wide at the bottom. It's coming up the leg. And what I'm saying back to the beginning of the story, this didn't exist in the world. Yeah. Like that. Now it becomes more in time buttons are closer together it's all top stitched because the denim stretches so all of it is lined um and there's an assortment of what wow stitching Vic, that's bad what a I guy love named that. Vic waters called this a gap -Stony. he invented the name so sometimes it's up to here goes down to there you're seeing it here's a different gap so that's oh wow that's really cool back. michael i love that look all right so you got what's going on there yeah that's really cool and the other way to tell what these are as you see them in pictures you could see always this these pockets in the front and the button fly so you could go see pictures of david ruffin he's in the pants but how can you tell you can tell by the pockets and the buttons um David Ruffin from The Temptations. David Ruffin from The Temptations. There's pictures of Alice Cooper in them. Lots and lots of people. Anyway. Okay, so again, there's no such thing as embroidery. Jimmy picks out some clothes. I need to figure out what size he is. So I give him a pair of pants. I go, Jimmy, go put these on. You know, let me see, you know, where we are in the sizing. And I can tell by looking at him what size he is, but I'm trying to play the game as best as I can and measure and all that stuff. So Jimmy walks over towards the bathroom in this hotel in downtown Tampa, and he takes off, and this is like two minutes to take off all the crap he's got, to yeah. the scarves around his waist, the scarves on the pants, he takes it all off. Now he takes the pants and the clothes that he's wearing into the bathroom. He's gone, whatever, 90 seconds or two minutes, I don't know, whatever. He comes back out. He's still in the same pants. He says, make them all like this. He just hands me to He says, make them all like this. 
He didn't want me to measure him. This is a shy, quiet, introverted, very well-mannered person. You're going, Mike, what are you talking about? I saw all the things, I saw all the whatever. The craziness, shy, lighting guitars on fire. <laughs> shy, introverted, well-mannered, what are you talking about? And I'm telling you the truth. Anyway, so we gather up the clothes now, we walk down the hallway, push the elevator thing. We're standing there waiting for the elevator. Somebody called Jimi Hendrix of the Jimi Hendrix Experience, he's walking down the hallway, and this is the costume, bare feet, dark pink pants, jeans, a flowered shirt, and he says, what all musicians always say from the beginning of time till today. They ask you this question, are you coming to the gig tonight? I said, what the hell are you talking about? Are we coming to the gig? Of course we're coming to the gig. He, he actually asked you to make a lot of clothes, like multiple clothes, and I remember you telling me, you said, people were just stealing his clothes constantly. We're gonna go over the letter, but in the letter, which will, I'll show to you. In the letter, he says, I need clothes espresso. That's one line. Uh, further on, he says, send whatever you have immediately. I need clothes by January 18th or whatever, February 18th, whatever the date was. And I'm thinking, dude, I'm sending you whole wardrobes every, whatever, two to three months. Shirts, pants, jackets, scarves, armbands, piles of clothes. And you're telling, you're making out like you got no clothes. What are you talking about? How could this be? What's at the back of this? I finally figured out, and again, I'm a little slow, so I, I put it together. Where are the clothes going? The girls are stealing the clothes. They got a piece of Jimi Hendrix. That's the yeah. A. B. I'm making for him. These trousers from Woodstock. From Woodstock. It's a photograph taken by a man named Dick Cunningham when he's 18 years old. He goes to Woodstock. He's a professional photographer to this day. And he's got. See the buttons at the bottom. Cloth covered buttons. Now, what were those made of? Those were made of this. This is rayon velvet, so it's a rayon material with the velvet face to it. And I'm taking it, putting it on an ironing board, a professional ironing board, and the difference is that your ironing board weighs 15 pounds, this weighs 150 pounds. I mean, it's so thick, so heavy, you can't imagine. And I'm using an industrial iron, and I'm going like this. Then I'm going like that, and then I'm just going up the you know, and doing that and then doing that so industrial iron it has a special Teflon foot that's separate and it has a long tube of water being pumped to it under pressure there's no such thing as crushed velvet in those days or if there is it was never in any place that I ever saw it so let me just say to you that this rayon velvet that does not stretch is made for proper ladies' gowns. Yeah. End of story. This is not made for rock and roll. This is not <laughs> made for tight pants. For crouching down, holding your guitar like a ray gun, and spraying the crowd. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Now, didn't you tell me that he asked you to double stitch the pants? Jerry Stickles was his road manager. Now Jimmy has died. It's maybe three or four years after we're making clothes for Robin Trower. Robin Trower's playing in the next town, Lakeland, Florida. And it's the end of the tour. And afterwards we go to a restaurant to eat some food. So it's Robin, myself, a few other people, and Jerry Stickles. And we're talking. Jerry Stickles says, 
it was my job to buy lighter fluid for Mr. Hendricks. So this is his culture and his respect for Jimmy. And he tells a story, or we hear a story, that Jimmy plays in his hometown of Seattle on a revolving stage. And he's wearing some of Michael and Tony's tight rock and roll pants. And he drops down his tushy to the ground with the guitar in front of him, splits the pants from the front all the way down to the bottom, all the way to the back, splits, and they throw him an English Union Jack that he ties like a... Like a diaper, kind of, right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and this is a shirt that was in Life magazine, okay? And... The Jimmy wore, right? The Jimmy wore. Well, in Life magazine, I didn't wear it. You can best... Well, I'm just letting people know because they, no, no, you no, know, no, that's no. that's significant. Look there. at this. It's not there. What's that? So take a look at that pattern right there. And then here in Life magazine, look at Jimmy down here. Focus on that. That absolutely right there. That's exactly right. Is that same pattern. Okay. Same pattern. So he wears this shirt, and one of the ways you can tell a lot of our clothes is that they have square tip collars. Okay, that's one way you'll see it. Another way you're going to see the seams down the front and back. So there's a seam right over your tush, there's a seam right over your knees. Now, what we call here this stuff. Jimmy writes in a letter, try to match the color of the sticky type buttons to the color of the shirt or as close as possible. What are we really saying? What are we even talking about? Velcro just came out then. This is 1968 or 69. And I cut out the squares, sew them onto the shirt. I don't think anything of it because I think he's I'm thinking it's going to be closed I'm forgetting that a lot of the times he's just tying not it's totally open he's just tying the shirt bottoms oh, the front okay. around his waist so that's why he's asking you to match the sticky type buttons but he never heard the word velcro yeah but he had his own language his own poetry so we're talking about sticky type buttons but He's living in a completely different place of love and of art. And so you just got to figure out, well, what is he talking about? Well, so plus, what's kind of cool, Michael, is that he's the way he wears his clothes or your clothes is not how you intended. So he's actually giving you a whole new perspective on sometimes. how you have to create sometimes. Definitely, definitely. How many clothes would you guess maybe that you made him over the hundreds, years? Hundreds. So this is what I'm showing you now. This is what's called a Spanish shawl. So it's silk, it's hand embroidered. So there's the one side, there's another side. It's the same on both sides, it's hand done. Got it? Mm -hmm. Now you're seeing fringe, which Michael loves fringe, needless to say. And the fringe is silk also, as are all the knotting. You got the whole deal. So, Michael sees this fabric in the junk store that someone's donated, Goodwill, and Michael buys it. Well, what's he gonna do with it? Let's hook Jimmy up, baby. Let's make pants and shirts. So, Michael makes a shirt for James Marshall Hendricks where the corner, let me get the right corner, the outside part here. The right corner of the shawl is sort of there. And it folds over at his shoulder, okay? Now, I come back from buying fabric one day. And I walk in the house and Tony says, Jimmy's on the phone. 
He's in England. I've been talking to him for 20 minutes. In 1968 or 69 or 70, this is like saying, uh, oh, I'm talking to Harry. He's on the moon. And, <laughs> you know, it was 1-800-HARRY. I just called him to say hello. I'm going, what the hell are you even... Jimmy's in... He's in England. You're talking to him on the phone. How could that be? Yeah. Annie, you've been talking to him for 20 minutes. It costs, it's got to cost $10,000. So she hands me the phone. What does Michael do? His usual thing. He goes into what I'm making. So I describe the pants and the shirts that I'm making with the fringe, hand-embroidered silk, piano shawls, Spanish piano shawls. And he says to me, is it too far out? This is Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> He's in the damn dictionary under far out. Yeah. Says, is it too far out? What are you talking about? Is it too far out? What the? Anyway, um, my point is, is that I'm going to show you this letter where he's talking about what we're talking about. There's the letter that Jimmy wrote you. And I'm just going to highlight one thing he's saying, we're dear couple, I need clothes, you know. I would like to have at least four of everything, including different but comfortable armbands. Please don't use stiff, hard material for the pants. Use your own wise judgment and imagination. Please have them ready expresso. Let me just stop there and say the girls are stealing the clothes. That's why he's talking about that. <laughs> as soon as you can, I need clothes desperately. And I'm giving him every three to four months complete wardrobe. Shirts, pants, jackets, scarves, armbands. Please keep in mind a beautiful material, white, soft, and maybe purple or fine fur, black suit. Um, tribe working in stones and jewelry in vest and pants, etc., etc. More shirts with odd sleeves, very soft material, not all the same material. Large flowing colors. Sticky type button, same color as material or at least as close as possible. And while we're on the topic and they're here, this is what we're talking about. That is Velcro and that's what he's calling a ski type button. Continuing, best part, very Jimmy. Any other thing you may run across, please don't be hesitant to take and make something, anything, to your fancy <laughs> as long as it's specially made as art. Awesome. He's concerned about what you're seeing. And when he walks out, your mind says yes, no, or cool, or not cool, or whatever words you want to use there. But he's he, like Macho Man, is doing whatever he's got to do to get the clothes. And those are the and sleeves, this, the crazy sleeves he was mentioning there. There's a good example. Right. He called them a witch sleeve or a wizard sleeve. It's there. And that material there in that is that. And there's a zillion pictures of that. That's so cool. Let's say six months before he died. He said to me three things. And understand I'm a person that deals with stuff my own way. Yeah. Just the way you do. So he says, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be doing what I'm doing. So I take it, I package it quietly, and just slide it under the rug later. I don't want to think about that. What does that mean? I don't know how much longer I'm going to be needing clothes. I'm going, well, package that, put it under the And the, whatever the third thing is, I don't remember it. But my point is that he was trying to tell me he was feeling this whole thing is coming to an end. I'm blowing the whole thing off. And I had little or no experience of losing a friend. So I'm 26 years old. You know, he had been with us 
maybe four days very soon before he died. Um, he had played in Miami, we brought him back, he stayed in a motel in St. Pete, you know, we went to the Morrison's, Morrison's cafeteria for lunch, you know, and this is like an old time kind of thing where you go through the line and you say, I want some of that, and they're spooning the, you know, baked potatoes yeah. or whatever, you know, and the people behind that are spooning it out, it's Jimmy, then me, and then I don't know if it's Tony and Elena, who knows. As we're going through, they're saying to me, it's Jimmy Hendrix. Yeah, and now you go and sit down, then they bring you the food on a plate, then you tip the waiter. Jimmy, huge tipper. Why? I'm saying to you, in his life, he must have been a waiter at some point because he knew the value of what this thing was and he took care of this guy in a big way. Anyway, um, I'm trying to say he was very human and the beauty of this person just came out in the music in his request for the clothes, in him wearing the clothes, in him performing, but he internally was shy and quiet and reserved and very well-mannered, very well-mannered. I got well-mannered stories that, you know, whatever. Can I ask you the one odd question sure. I know everybody has to be thinking? Sure. Did you ever trip with Jimmy? I mean, everybody, tri and because I remember in your documentary, well, you said, well, back then. I say no to that. Are you kidding me? Because <laughs> yes. I was just saying, one thing you forget is that w one thing you mentioned in your documentary is originally acid wasn't illegal. That's exactly right. And, and then so it the became... answer to it's yes, and it's the next time we do this, it's a long story. We'll do it. <laughs> okay. All right, what great stories. Now I wanted to pretty much end the vlog by going mm -hmm. over and showing that Jimi Hendrix sign they have over there where he performed. And we're rolling into downtown Tampa here. I think what we're looking for is that sign right there, actually. Yep, let's park. So we've made it over to Curtis Hicks and Waterfront Park, and as you saw when we were driving in, they do have a sign. It says, Jimi Hendrix is one of the most influential musicians and guitarists of the 20th century. His legacy, dedication, and passion for music transcends all boundaries and brings people from all walks of life together. He played two nights here in Tampa, August 18th and November 23rd, 1968, at what was once Curtis Hickson Hall, which is now the beautiful Curtis Hickson Waterfront Park. It is important to note that out of the 216 concerts Hendrix played from 1967 to 70, with the Jimi Hendrix Experience, two of them were in Tampa. The Jimi Hendrix Experience had been on the road touring for at least two years by the time they came here to the city for their presentation of Fire. Both concerts were near sellouts with over 7,000 fans attending each night. Sadly, Jimi Hendrix was only 27 years old when he passed away, but his life had had a lasting impact on the musicians of Tampa Bay and as a part of the rich history of downtown Tampa. Find yourself first. And then your talent, work hard in your mind so it can come alive. Everybody come alive, everybody love alive. So that concert hall would have been right here and what they neglected to put on that sign is what we talked about today. This is where he met the man that made his clothes, Michael Braun. All right, my friends, we're gonna call it a day. Thank you, Melissa Boykin, Brigitte 07, Robert Reddy for becoming my newest Patreons. Thank you, Michael, for the fantastic time and all the great stories, and thank you all for watching. Go listen to some Jimi Hendrix. Have a great night, and goodbye.